the oceans cover some 70% of our planet, and I think Arthur C. Clarke probably had it right when he said that perhaps we ought to call our planet, uh, planet ocean. And the oceans are hugely productive, as you can see with the satellite image of photosynthesis, the production of new life. In fact, the oceans produce half of the new life every day on Earth, as well as about half the oxygen that we breathe. In addition to that, it harbors a lot of the biodiversity on Earth, and much of it we don't know about, but I'll tell you some of that today. That also doesn't even get into the whole uh, protein extraction that we do from the oceans, about 10% of our, uh, our global needs and 100% of some island nations. If you were to descend into the 95% of the biosphere that's livable, it would quickly become pitch black, interrupted only by pinpoints of light from bioluminescent organisms. And if you turn the lights on, you might periodically see spectacular organisms swim by, because those are the denizens of the deep, the things that live in the deep ocean. And eventually, the deep sea floor would come into view. This type of habitat covers more of the Earth's surface than all other habitats combined. And yet, we know more about the surface of the moon and about Mars than we do about this habitat, despite the fact that we have yet to extract a gram of food, a breath of oxygen, or a drop of water from those bodies. Our country has two exploration programs. One is NASA, with a mission to explore the, the great beyond, to explore the heavens, which we all want to go to if we're lucky. And you can see we have Sputnik and we have a, a Saturn and we have a, a other manifestations of space exploration. Well, there's also another program that in another agency within our government in ocean exploration. It's in NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And my question is this, why are we ignoring the oceans? Here's the reason, or not the reason, but here's why I ask that question. If you compare NASA's budget annual budget to explore the heavens, that one-year budget would fund NOAA's budget to explore the oceans for 1,600 years. Most of the southern hemisphere is unexplored. Uh, we had more uh, exploration ships down there during Captain Cook's time than now. It's amazing. All right, so we're going to immerse ourselves in the 72% of the planet because, you know, it, it, it's really naive to think that the Easter Bunny put all the resources on the continents. <laughs> you know? It's just ludicrous. The, we are always constantly playing the zero-sum game. You know, you know we're going to do this, we're going to take it away from something else. I, I believe in just enriching the economy. And, and we're leaving so much on the table, 72% of the planet, and as I will point out later in the presentation, 50% of the United States of America lies beneath the sea. 50% of our country that we own, have all legal jurisdiction, have all rights to do whatever we want, lies beneath the sea, and we have better maps of Mars than that 50%. And today, we've only explored about 3%, 3% of what's out in the ocean. Already, we found the world's highest mountains, world's deepest valleys, underwater lakes, underwater waterfalls, a lot of that we shared with you from the stage. And in a place where we thought no life at all, we find more life, we think, in diversity and density than the tropical rainforest, which tells us that we don't know much about this planet at all. There's still 97%, and either that 97% is empty or just full of surprises. But I want to jump up to shallow water now and look at some creatures that are positively amazing. In the next scene, you're going to see a nice coral bottom, and you'd see that an octopus would stand out very easily there if you couldn't use your camouflage, use your skin to change color and texture. There's some algae in the foreground, and an octopus. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? Saving the oceans is more than an ecological desire. It's more than a thing we're doing because we want to create jobs for fishermen or preserve fishermen's jobs. It's more than an economic pursuit. Saving the oceans can feed the world. Let me show you how. As you know, there's already more than a billion hungry people on this planet. We're expecting that problem to get worse as world population grows to 9 billion or 10 billion by mid-century, and we can expect to have greater pressure on our food resources. And this is a big concern, especially considering where we are now. Now we know that our arable land per capita is already on the decline in both developed and developing countries. We know that we're headed for climate change, which is going to change rainfall patterns, making some areas drier, as you can see in orange, and others wetter in blue, causing droughts in our bread baskets in places like the Midwest and Central Europe and floods in others. It's going to make it harder for the land to help us solve the hunger problem. 
And that's why the oceans need to be their most abundant, so that the oceans can provide us as much food as possible. And that's something the oceans have been doing for us for a long time. As far back as we can go, we've seen an increase in the amount of food we've been able to harvest from our oceans. It just seemed like it was continuing to increase until about 1980 when we started to see a decline. You've heard of peak oil. Maybe this is peak fish. I hope not. I'm going to come back to that. But you can see about an 18% decline in the amount of fish we've gotten in our world catch since 1980. And this is a big problem. It's continuing. This red line is continuing to go down. But we know how to turn it around. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. We know how to turn that curve back upwards. This doesn't have to be peak fish. If we do a few simple things in targeted places, we can bring our fisheries back and use them to feed people. Well, based on our work in the United States and elsewhere, we know that there are three key things we have to do to bring fisheries back. And they are, we need to set quotas or limits on how much we take. We need to reduce bycatch, which is the accidental catching and killing of fish that we're not targeting, and it's very wasteful. And three, we need to protect habitats, the nursery areas, the spawning areas, that these fish need to grow and reproduce successfully so that they can rebuild their populations. If we do those three things, we know the fisheries will come back. Industrial fishing uses big stuff, big machinery. We use nets that are 20 miles long. We use long lines that have one million or two million hooks. And we trawl, which means to take something the size of a tractor trailer truck that weighs thousands and thousands of pounds, put it on a big chain and drag it across the seafloor to stir up the bottom and catch the fish. And, and think of it as being kind of the bulldozing of a city or of a forest because it, it, it clears it away. And the habitat destruction is unbelievable. This is a photograph, a typical photograph of what the continental shelves of the world look like. You can see the rows in the bottom, the way you can see the rows in a field that has just been plowed to plant corn. What that was, was a forest of sponges and coral, which is a critical habitat for the development of fish. What it is now is mud. And um, the area of the ocean floor that has been transformed from forest to level mud to parking lots is equivalent to the entire area of all the forests that have ever been cut down on all of the earth in the history of humanity. And we've managed to do that in the last 100 to 150 years. Now, another form of pollution uh, that's biological pollution is what happens from excess nutrients. The Green Revolution, all this artificial nitrogen fertilizer, we use too much of it, it's subsidized, what's one of the reasons we use too much of it, it runs down the rivers and it feeds the plankton, the little microscopic plant cells in the coastal water. But since we ate all the oysters and we ate all the fish that would eat the plankton, there's nothing to eat the plankton and there's more and more of it, so it dies of old age, which is unheard of for plankton, and when it dies, it falls to the bottom and then bacteria, uh, it rots, uh, which means that bacteria break it down and in the process they use up all the oxygen and in using up all the oxygen they make the environment utterly lethal for anything that can't swim away. And so what we end up with is a microbial zoo dominated by bacteria and jellyfish as you see on the left uh, in front of you and the only fishery left and it is a commercial fishery is the jellyfish fishery you see on the right where they used to be prawns even in Newfoundland where we used to catch cod we now have a jellyfish fishery. On oceans the same for climate I just put this on the on the floor because I think it's important to recognize that we always talk warming but climate change has this dramatic chemical challenge as well. This is the pH curve in the world's oceans over the past 25 million years. And just look at what pH has done uh, since the Industrial Revolution. A 30% decline, an acidification of you know, extraordinary speed. This comes only from one source, and that is carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel burning. It is simple high school chemistry. And carbon dioxide plus water becomes carbonic acid, and carbonic acid changes 
the calcium carbonate in the ocean and breaks it up, which are the building blocks for marine life. So from phytoplankton all the way to coral reefs get corroded by this acidification. Now what you see here in dark green is the pre-industrial level of calcium carbonate, the Lego blocks that build marine life on Earth. And as you see in the black dots here are all the coral reefs. There's not a coincidence that in the Holocene, coral reefs established themselves where there was a lot of Lego. Now, this is the situation today, and this is the situation if we continue as usual. We're breaking down the calcium carbonate availability for marine life in the world's ocean. This is the chemical drama of the climate challenge.